So I'm Dr. Chris Moulin. I'm a senior lecturer in cognitive neuropsychology. And I'm going to talk to you in this podcast about a very fundamental concept in memory and cognitive psychology, which is about the relationship between encoding and retrieval. This is a core concept in cognitive psychology and one that I encounter in my daily life as a memory researcher. So the plan of what I'm going to talk about today is basically got three parts to it. I'm going to start off by introducing you to the three phases of memory, which are encoding, storage and retrieval. I'm going to talk about two classic studies from the 1970s about this kind of topic and the relationship between encoding and retrieval. But I'm trying to illustrate this point with some things that are of interest to students. People are studying and trying to memorize and learn new information. But I'm also going to wrap up by telling you a little bit about contemporary research using memory cues and the ways in which we can help people's memory impairment. There's a photograph on this first slide and this is just to remind me to tell you that psychology is a very new science and some of these concepts that we talk about in cognitive psychology are only as old as the 1970s, perhaps some of them as old as the 1960s. But as a result, unlike chemistry and physics, the people who came up with the fundamental concepts I'm going to be talking about today are still alive and they're still productive and they're still working. And some of these ideas are very fresh. And it's important to remember that because from our perspective of people who were born after the 1970s, we think of these ideas as old, but they're not. They're very current and alive still. And that's the kind of flavor I want to give you in this podcast. So the three phases of memory all need to be intact in order for you to retrieve some information. The classic question we might ask somebody is, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You can think about what you had for breakfast this morning, but essentially to answer this question, what you need to do is you need to have encoded the information. That means you need to have taken the information in. We often call that study, but you don't study your breakfast, you just eat your breakfast. But to remember it later, you need to have encoded it. It needs to have been registered into your memory bank, so to speak. The middle phase is storage. And in fact, storage is one of the things that we don't know so much about. But it's certain that when the information is encoded, it is stored in some way. Because the final phase is retrieval. And retrieval is just getting the information back out again. So if you're able to tell me what you had for breakfast, it means that these three things are intact. And they're working in unison. And they're working well together. So the story of this podcast is to tell you some of the critical issues in the encoding phase in particular. So one of the things that we know about encoding is that it takes actually quite a lot of effort and attention. But we don't have to walk around like moronic computers so that when we see something we press a save button in order to record it. We can just go about our business and it will be retained and encoded in some way. Godden and Baddeley carried out an influential study on the relationship between encoding and retrieval. So think back to that picture I showed you of the two gentlemen on the first slide. One of those was Alan Baddeley and the other one was Fergus Craik. We'll come back to Fergus Craik in a minute, but this is a study run by Alan Baddeley. And Alan Baddeley is one of the founding fathers of cognitive psychology and certainly human memory studies. And in the 1970s, he was aware of the need for scientists to show the application of his research. And in this way, he was interested in looking at memory performance in natural contexts and with natural materials and whilst people were doing special tasks. One of the things they wanted to know was about memory performance in divers. So his research was looking at the ability to memorize word lists in people on land and underwater. But the interesting thing that Alan Baddeley did was in his experiment he tested people both on land and underwater and he gave materials on land and underwater but he mixed up whether they were tested in the same environment where they'd learned the material or in a different environment. So for example you might learn a list of wor words underwater but then be tested on them when you were back on land. And the details of this experiment are that word lists were administered in each of these locations all the divers did all the different conditions. And the critical thing is the results were really exciting. Recall from these word lists was about 50% better 
when you were studying the words and retrieving the words in the same location. So this was a um, kind of a matching between how you encoded the words and how you retrieved the words. So these are divers, they're 20 feet under the water, and if they learn it 20 feet under the water, they remember it better when they're 20 feet under the water. So in order to demonstrate how uh, this theory is relevant in modern terms, we have to go back to memory basics. And I need to tell you about two different forms of memory test. Essentially, these are recall and recognition, and they're two different ways that you can test the same materials. So now I'm going to set you a very brief memory test. The slide you'll now see has got a list of words on it. Pause the video. Don't pause it too long. Don't write them down. Don't cheat. Just have a look at these words and try and remember them. So the first way I can test you is with recall. If you cast your mind back to the words I showed you, just a short list of words, you can try and tell me as many of those words as you can from that list. So you would just be reproducing the words and saying Christmas and so on. You could do that by writing it down or you could do it by saying it out loud, but the principle is the same. You would be reproducing that information and I wouldn't be giving you any clues or any cues, you would just be doing it. The second test is recognition. So now on the slide, I'm giving you another list, and this is a longer list. And it includes all the words I gave you before, plus some new ones, and they're intermixed with each other. And in this task, you would say yes if it's a word I showed you before, and no if it's a new word that I didn't show you before. And in essence, here you have the difference between recall and recognition. Recall is where you produce things and it's relatively effortful. Whereas recognition is just a low level, relatively automatic process of being able to say yes or no whether you encountered the information before. And you might like to think about how those work in the real world and what tasks you do that are recall tasks like in an exam and what are recognition tasks such as uh, bumping into a friend on the street. Why this is important is because in later experiments badly returned to the diver's idea and compared recall and recognition. And the interesting thing is this context effect only worked on recall and it didn't work on recognition. So recognition was always good no matter what the context was. The context only gave this benefit to memory when you tested people by recall. And naturally enough, this got people thinking about what was different between recall and recognition. And the answer seems to be that context acts as a cue to get people back to the information in order to retrieve it in the recall test. But that doesn't really need to be done in the recognition test. So the second classic study we come to is Craig and Tolving, 1975. And this study makes a very simple point, which is the fact that elaboration during encoding benefits later retrieval. Now that's a fairly simple idea, the more you work with material, the better you'll remember it later. But they had some experimental evidence for that. And their experiment gave sentences like you will see on the slide, one of which is longer and requires more elaboration, and the other of which is shorter and requires less elaboration. So you can read those sentences now and solve them, i.e. give a word at the end that completes the sentence in a meaningful way. And then what we would test you on later is that word that you generated. And we'd find that for the longer, more complex sentence, where you had to elaborate more, your memory would be better. This just illustrates the point that elaboration during encoding, the more you think about it, the more you work with the material, the better your memory will be later. I'm going to discuss now ways in which these ideas about encoding, storage and retrieval might be useful to students in learning situations. And this is one application of this research work. So let's start with elaboration. You don't need to be a genius to work out the more you elaborate with material, the better you'll retain it later. Of course, this is a main goal of education. All your coursework and all the worksheets that you do are about solving problems. And the idea is, is that in solving problems, you learn about how to solve problems, but you also retain the information that you've worked with much better than if you're not solving problems and if you're not working with the material. The second considers cues and context. We can take points two and three together. So Godden and Baddeley with the divers suggest that there's a, a powerful effect of context on our retrieval. Now let's say 
you want to do well in an exam and therefore you want to match the state of encoding with the state of retrieval. Well in fact you'll probably do your revising in your bedroom but you can't sit your exam in the bedroom, you have to sit it in the sports hall or wherever you sit your exams. So that's a problem. And in fact, we find that those kinds of contexts, environmental contexts, don't show such a powerful effect after all. But what is a more powerful concept and what is a better thing to think about is the effect of cues. So cues you can make for yourself. So in revising, if you have a list of things you want to remember, you can make a cue which is elaborated, which is based on the materials that you're trying to remember and connected with it, but that when you see that cue, relatively automatically, the answer comes to mind. So let's say you wanted to remember the name of a famous psychologist such as Thorndike. You might start imagining in your mind a rose because rose goes well with thorn and that way you could use rose as a cue to retrieve Thorndike, which is a relatively difficult thing to retrieve on its own. My final point refers to a very modern idea in student education, the idea of desirable difficulties. One of the things we've learned from memory research is the more difficult it is to process things and the more you have to work with the materials, the better your memory is eventually. If you think about recognition, recognition is actually a rather easy thing to perform. So if you think about a multiple choice test, students tend to like multiple choice tests because they find them relatively easy, because it's recognition they're doing and not recall. But the recognition can seduce you into thinking you know things when in fact you don't know things. So in a revision situation, if you test yourself by recognition, you'll be overestimating how much you know because the recognition will come easier, but it would be much more difficult to recall the information, to re reproduce it from nothing. The idea of desirable difficulties is related to this idea. What we're trying to do is educators is make things difficult for students to do in order to enhance their learning experience. And one of the reasons why this is interesting is because students might not like it. They might say that teacher makes things difficult or why is this material so difficult? Why am I struggling th with this? And the idea is, is that that is ultimately better for your retention of, your of the material than if we make it very easy thing for you to do with lots of recognition tasks for instance. Finally we come to how important these kinds of ideas about cues and the match between encoding and retrieval, how important they are for us now. And throughout this podcast, I've been wearing this device here, which is a SenseCam. And the SenseCam is an experimental device developed by Microsoft Research at Cambridge. And we've been doing some research with this device. Essentially, it's uh, a digital camera with a fisheye lens which takes photos according to sensors within it. So it takes a photo every two or three minutes. What we find in the context of our research is that when you represent people with these films of their life, it acts as a very powerful cue to their memory. So we can give these to people with memory impairment in order to help them kind of work in daily life and to have a, a, an intact memory again. And you might be thinking, well, how does that link to what's gone before and the drier experimental work? The idea is this, I've, I've told you about how important cues and context are in memory, but they're in very dry laboratory settings. Imagine how cool it would be if you went through life and you could always jog your memory by giving a powerful visual cue. And that's what this device does for you. You review your day as a series of, of images all stitched together as a film and you can um, show one here. I've uploaded one as part of this podcast. And the idea is, is that looking at this is, is helping you retrieve memories by taking you back to the instances of your encoding. So to summarise, Successful memory function relies on encoding, storage and retrieval and each one of these needs to be intact for you to have the experience of retrieving something that you learned earlier. In human memory there's a crude division between recall and recognition and this is one of the ways in which we explore memory impairment and so on. Recall is enhanced by many factors including context and elaboration and it's these two factors that I've considered in the experiments described here today. So finally, you might like to think about how these things apply to your own student learning and how you can take them forward in everyday life. You might like to think about how they apply to psychology in terms of models of human memory and how memory is impaired, but you should be able to find, even if you're not that interested in cognitive psychology, that these are important concepts. If you're reading a book and trying to revise, close the book, 
and practice recall rather than just blankly recognizing the information that you're reading. Try and think about the times in which you're using recognition and recall and see how that goes for your studying and whether you can actually shift from doing recognition maybe to doing more recall.